Hey everybody, it's Lon Seip and we are here at CES 2023. This is Dispatch 3 from the show and believe it or not, the show actually only officially opened about an hour ago, but there's all these pre-show events that we never want to miss and that's what you've been watching. Today is going to be a busy day for us. We're going to hit the show floor and then we're also going to go to another event in the evening where a bunch of companies are clustered together called Showstoppers. So we're going to have probably an 11 hour day today, but we really enjoy doing this and we really like bringing it to you. And all the comments I've been getting have been great and really helping to guide us in our journey here. Now, before we get into the show today, I do want to thank our sponsor, the High Soul Company Virtual Cluster. They're a startup incubator located in Seoul, Korea, with over 1,000 talented companies on its roster. And only the best companies make the high soul list after a careful selection process that looks at a company's growth, technology, and competence. And what I mentioned to you earlier in this week, that we're going to go meet some of these companies. And that's what we're going to do right now. So let's head in and see some of these innovative Korean companies that you can partner your company with. So the first company we're checking out here is Zynaps. And this company is doing AI voiceovers. And what they can do is take about 10 minutes of audio from a professional voice actor and either make a voice that sounds just like that actor or mash up a bunch of get together and make voices that have never been heard before. And you might be thinking this is pretty bad for voice actors, but uh, right now in Korea there are a number of voice actors who have licensed the sound of their voice to Zynaps and they're able to earn revenue just off the sound of their voice without actually having to record anything. And there's some advantages to this because if you notice something with the script after the fact, you don't have to go back into the studio to re-record. You can actually just change the text and generate a new audio file. And we're going to have something for you to listen to here. So right now my friend is typing some stuff in, some text. And what we're going to do is have uh, two pre uh, presidents uh, endorse the Lon.TV YouTube channel. So we've got Joe Biden and Donald Trump there. And we're going to generate a little endorsement script here. And you'll be able to listen to what it sounds like. Every night in the White House, I watch Lon TV. Subscribe and hit that bell icon. Every night in the White House, I watch Lon TV. Subscribe and hit that bell icon. Now, you can find it over at Zynaps.ai. Next month, they're going to have a little uh, form you can fill out to have it generate some text for you. They are currently doing 13 languages. So English, obviously, being one of them, along with Korean and a few others. And they do watermark the recordings that are generated so people know that this came from an AI generation. And those watermarks are not audible but can be picked up so people know what's real and what's not. Now the next company we're checking out here is called AI Zen. And this is a rather interesting AI project here. So think about this. If you've got a fleet of commercial electric vehicles like school buses or trucks, we got that Tesla Semi coming out, for example, the risk on the bank is not only the creditworthiness of the company leasing or buying these vehicles, it's also the residual value of the battery inside of those vehicles because the batteries are very expensive. So what they do is a top to bottom AI analysis, not only of creditworthiness, but what conditions those vehicles might be facing insofar as miles driven, the kind of terrain they may be driving over, what kind of wear and tear will there be on the battery when the lease ends and what's the value afterward. And they, be, they basically come up with a full uh, value and risk proposition to a lender so they know what they're getting into ahead of time and can make an appropriate financing offer. So this is a company called Nuvi Lab, and this is an interesting concept. What they've got here is an AI model that will look at a cafeteria, a food service institution, a restaurant, basically anything that, uh, any place that is serving food. And we've got a little demo here with a tray with some meatballs, some chicken wings, and some rice here. And if Jake pans up, he can see that the AI has detected uh, the type of food that is on the tray, and it also does a mass analysis to try to determine how much weight is there. And if I take a meatball away or two here, you can see that it now sees fewer meatballs than it did before. And if I put them back on here, it immediately recognizes them again. Now, what's this used for? Well, think about any food service institution that is serving lunches or dinners or anything else. They want to probably see how much food is getting thrown out. 
Maybe that's going to uh, kind of help you understand your food waste problem. Maybe it's going to show you that people may not like your meatballs all that much, and maybe you've got to change the recipe, again, based on what's being thrown out. And typically, a lot of food service institutions don't look at what's going in the trash, but this system does, and it records data, and it can provide some very useful analytics for how you might be able to adjust things in the kitchen, for example, and make the food tastier and perhaps have less of it thrown out after somebody's done dining. There's also other nutritional kinds of opportunities, especially for little kids who are a little more picky about their food. You can kind of track what the kid is eating over time as well. So a pretty neat concept here that I think has a lot of applications and the company is called NuviLab. So we're visiting Eureka Park on the lower level of the Venetian Exposition Center. And you always find some cool stuff here. And I know a lot of you are fans of physical media. And what I'm holding here looks like a Blu-ray disc it's actually the same size as a Blu-ray, but this disc can hold 500 gigabytes, which is like five times what you can buy on a blank Blu-ray disc today for long-term data storage. This is from a company called Folio Photonics. They're still in development, so you can't actually buy this right now, but I thought the process they're taking here is rather clever. So what they're using is this plastic film that's readily available, and a Blu-ray typically has two or three layers in which you can write data on. Uh, this disc I was just holding has eight, and it's the same size, and the material here is actually less expensive and more reliable over time. You're not going to get the bit rot and some of the other things that come into play when you have these layered Blu-ray discs, so it uh, might be more robust and more affordable along with more storage capacity. What's neat, though, is that the lasers they're using are actually just from current Blu-ray laser technology. There's nothing new here. And so the storage density is increasing based on the material that they're using as opposed to trying to reinvent the wheel. Now, this might work from a read standpoint with an existing Blu-ray player, but you'll probably would need a special writing, writer to do uh, some of the things that they're looking to do here. But all in, I think there's still some life left for optical discs, especially if you've got a lot of data to store, like I do long term, that you don't need to access all the time. Now, this disc holds 500 gigabytes but they're coming up with a dual-sided disc that can do a terabyte, which is quite a bit for an optical disc. And eventually they're going to add more layers as well to increase that storage density. So I always like to stop by Central Hall and check out all the gaming stuff. And we started off here right with the first booth we saw, which is Razer. And here's something that looked a little different to me. This is a huge webcam called the Kio Pro Ultra. This has an enormous sensor, they said, the biggest one uh, on a webcam that's available. And I kind of believe that given the size of it. Uh, it's a one, uh, looks like a one or a one and a half inch Sony Starvis 2 sensor. It is 4K, of course. And it also is running at a 1.7 aperture. So you might be able to get a nice little bit of bokeh on your webcam, provided your monitor can support the weight of that thing. This one might be a fun one to pick up and give a test run of. Now this is the Razer Edge. This is a gaming handheld. It's actually a tablet that can be detached from the controller that it's attached to. This is not a phone, but a gaming tablet. It's kind of similar, I guess, to the Logitech device we looked at earlier, but it looks more premium. The display looks really nice on it. It's running with a new Snapdragon processor designed for gaming. This is the G3X Gen 1, and I'm not sure how that's going to compete against maybe the Tegra that we have in our NVIDIA Shields, but I would imagine this might actually perform better than many of these other gaming devices have performed. What's of interest to me here is that they're really promoting this as a streaming device, even though it's got enough horsepower, I think, to run some games pretty nicely on its own. And this is kind of a uh, Android chicken and egg problem. But it does look very nice, and I think if you are someone who's into game streaming, this is a very attractive display and something that you can use as either a touch device in tablet mode in a very small form factor or with the attached controller. So we've heard of sound bars for televisions, but what about your PC? This is the Leviathan Pro, and Razer is rolling this out at the show here. This is really cool. This is a sound bar, but it's designed for a single user. And what it does is it enables a beamforming technology to have the audio wrap around you. And it's virtual surround sound sounds really good. I was surprised by how good this sounded. As you can see, there's a little camera and infrared sensor here on the front, and it's using that to track the location of your head and your ears, and it will adjust the uh, beam of the sound for the best effect. And there are virtual headphone modes or surround sound modes, and I found it all to be pretty convincing, actually. Along with the sound bar, 
There is a subwoofer also, so you get some good punch on the bass. It will work as a Bluetooth speaker, but it doesn't support any kind of phone calls or conferences or anything like that. So this is strictly kind of a gaming and entertainment device. Music sounds pretty good on it as well. And I was just uh, telling my friend here in the room that I probably would be spending more time just trying out each of the different modes versus actually playing the games perhaps on the PC. But it's a neat idea for kind of a personalized sound bar, especially if you don't like wearing headsets. So we stopped by the My Arcade booth, and I saw something here that I think a lot of my Atari fans in the audience are going to really love. This is an Atari a new plug-and-play, an HD one. But check it out. It comes with the console, but you get two controllers that are kind of retro-inspired. And many Atari games only had a single button to push. These have two, an A button where it should belong there on the top, but also a B button on the top there. And what this is going to do is play about 200 licensed Atari games. And they're telling me that uh, most of the games will have multiple versions. So this will be very similar to the Atari 50th compilation we just looked at. So if you liked Asteroids on the 2600 and the arcade, you can play both on this console here. I think it looks really cool. The controllers are wireless. And it's just nice to see that you can kind of get everything all in uh, one package here. It's going to come out over the summer. I don't think it's going to be all that expensive. And I think this one might be kind of popular. Now, if Jake tilts down a little bit, uh, they're going to have a handheld device as well that you can see there. Nice uh, 70s retro uh, look to that one. And then if we scroll up a little bit, they've got one of those mini arcades they're going to release as well. The mini arcade and the handheld have less games than the plug and play system, but uh, all in. This is something, the plug and play, I'm really kind of eager to uh, check out and see how it works. Now, one of my complaints with mini arcades is that they're not all that fun to play because the controls are really hard to work with. So they're trying to come up with some new ideas for the mini arcades. This is a Galaga that has a proper joystick on it, as you can see. It's still not the real arcade version of Galaga. It is a uh, kind of like a port that they made specifically for the device here. But it will be pretty much the same Galaga you played before on one of these mini arcades, but you might be able to play it a little bit better with a functional joystick. So I get a lot of stuff delivered via the U.S. Postal Service, as you can imagine, and we are in their next generation delivery vehicle. This is a prototype of the new delivery vehicles that you're going to see across the United States. They're telling me these are going to start rolling out next year. Some, I guess, will be gas-powered, and then they also have the option to make these as electric vehicles also as uh, the conditions in a particular area allow. And, of course, these are really designed to be functional. And as you can see here, you've got plenty of room for your mail carrier to do the delivery. We have the steering wheel on the right side because in the United States, that's where most of the mailboxes are. And what we're going to do here is just walk around to the... Uh, other side. Maybe I'll come around the front here with Jake. I got to lug my big backpack around here. So uh, let's take a look on the rear of the postal vehicle here. And it's got a much larger package area. In fact, you can stand up in here now. So as you can see, the Postal Service is really d doing a lot more packages than letters these days. So their, d their vehicle design here really looks at that uh, new, newer use case as something that they need to accommodate in their vehicles. So I think if you're in kind of a busier area, you'll probably start seeing these trucks early next year. Uh, in my area, maybe a little bit longer, but it's a uh, neat looking truck that will, I think, define mail delivery here in the U.S. for probably decades to come. Now, as many of you know, I love my LG OLED television, and this is a new one that looks spectacular. And what you're seeing here is an image on the screen that's not being delivered over an HDMI cable directly, but rather wirelessly. And if we look over here, there's a box that is doing all of the transmission. And this is designed for folks that want to hang a TV up on the wall, but want to keep their components somewhere else in the room. And it operates with very low latency, very high bandwidth wireless, but it does give you some more flexibility for locating your components somewhere that maybe is a little bit more aesthetically appealing. As you can imagine, this is going to be very expensive, but there is a market for people that want this kind of flexibility. And that image you're seeing there, which looks pristine and crystal clear, is all coming over a wireless signal. And by the way, that box will deliver 4K at up to 120 hertz wirelessly to the television set. Again, very low latency, and it should work well on the gaming side as well. But of course, a direct cable connection for gaming is always preferred. And I just wanted to show you some of the costs that some of these companies put into marketing themselves at this show. This is an experience that Canon is putting together at their booth. And as you can look around me here, we've got like a little cabin that they've put together. There's trees that they're hanging from the ceiling here with uh, 
pretty realistic looking little forest scene here. And this is the kind of stuff that companies do to get attention here because there's so many things that distract you. This was something we noticed right when we walked down. I can't even imagine what this cost to put together. Now, as many of you know, in my home studio, I shoot all of my videos live to disc. So when I'm making a recorded video, I'm actually doing it kind of like on a live stream. And that requires my cameras to output video into my vMix production system in real time. And for many years, I've been using camcorders to do that task, even right now. But on the lower end of the spectrum, the camcorders that I used to recommend, which were Canon Vixias, are no longer being manufactured. And I've been looking for lower price cameras as an equivalent for that purpose. And this new one from PTZ Optics might be something that uh, you should look into for doing you know, kind of mid-range live streaming. This is their Studio Pro camera. It does 1080p up to 60 frames per second. It has a 12x optical zoom, which you can control with a remote control or through software. It's got microphones built in, as you can see. And I wanted to show you some of the ports here on the back. So you have your HDMI out, of course, but you also see an Ethernet port because you can plug this into your network and output the video over the NDI standard, which most of the streaming apps like vMix or OBS support. And this Ethernet port is also PoE, so in your production environment, you can actually just plug this into your network, get power in and video out with just a single cable, which is really helpful. Additionally, you'll notice a little switch there above the gold sticker on the far left. And you can switch this thing into vertical mode if your streaming platform requires you to deliver video that way. And then you, you can, of course, switch it back to get your standard uh, landscape format. So a lot of neat stuff that they've thought of in this camera. And the price, honestly, for what it is, is not that bad. $699 is what it's going to sell for. It's coming out soon. We're going to try to get one in to review because I think this might be a really good solution for people looking for a lower cost way to get multiple cameras into their video production system. Hey, look who I ran into. It's Tyler, the antenna man. And we're just right next to the ATSC 3.0 booth. And I thought I would ask you, as the expert here, what, what's new and different and exciting for you at this show? Well, they got a lot more stuff going this year as opposed to three years ago, last time I was at CES. And I noticed their Sinclair has a demonstration where they're showcasing radio stations over ATSC 3.0, which is something that I didn't think to use it for. And they also unveiled a few um, dongles to pick up ATSC 3, both on TV and one on a smartphone. That's very interesting, and I think you might have some things on your channel covering some of these things? Yep, I'm covering for my YouTube channel all Next Gen TV stuff, and uh, I'll be posting probably in a few days. So I'm going to be setting my bookmark, <laughs> making sure my, uh, vi my watch later has got stuff loaded up from the flight from Tyler's channel. Where can people find you on, on the Internet? Antenna Man. So look for the Antenna Man. If you are trying to cut the cord, this is your guy. We have a great interview with him on the channel as well. And uh, Tyler, thanks for doing yeah, a quick interview. Thanks so much. So we are at our last event here at CES 2023. This is Showstoppers. And this event has never usually been all this big, but tonight it is huge. There's a lot to see here, so let's get to it. Now you've probably seen Jackery batteries out there. These are rather large batteries that you can take with you to keep stuff running over a longer period of time versus something that might fit in your bag. But now they've got the extra large here. This is the Solar Generator 3000 Pro. And this weighs about 62 pounds, not as much as I thought it would. And it can output 3,000 watts, and it's rated for about 3,000 watt hours. So if you were running something at one watt, you could get 3,000 hours out of it. And of course, the battery life will vary based on what you're running out of it. Of note, the AC outlets here will output the full 3,000 watts. It'll, of course, share everything based on what you're doing. It is pure sine wave, so if you have electronics that are sensitive for that sort of thing, it can adjust for that. And then you've got a bunch of USB ports here for outputting to phones and tablets and computers. And then, of course, your 12-volt connector here, kind of standard equipment on some of these larger batteries these days. Now, you can charge it with solar here. This is their 100-watt panel, but they recommend a larger one to really get this thing charged up out in the field. It can charge while it's being used, so you can have your devices continue to operate off of it while more charge is going in. Now, if you plug it into a home outlet, it can charge up in about three hours, they tell me, from nothing. So it can draw a lot of power to very quickly charge the battery. But I do like this notion of having something that can run 
off of solar, store that solar energy for the evening, and then, of course, get some more energy put back in when the sun comes up again. And the Jackery here is coming out in March, so look for that when it hits the market. So this was something unexpected. There is a new television operating system coming out from TiVo, and they've got a demo running here on a, Ves oops, on a Vestal TV, if I don't break it. Uh, and this is something new and different. This is not running on Android. It's a custom Linux operating system, and it's got a very clean interface. So if my friend here can scroll down a little bit, you can see it's got all the major apps available, and they're also doing a universal watch list. Now, we looked at the uh, TiVo Android TV a while back, and it was doing something similar where it collects content across all these different subscription services. You can add it to your watch list. They'll do content recommendations. Additionally, you can tell it what services you're subscribed to so that it knows what to recommend. And it's really looking pretty nice and clean. One of the things they told me is that it is not going to have any display advertising. So when you load it up, it's going to be completely content agnostic, or at least provider agnostic, insofar as what you see. And the revenue they are going to generate will come from their free section, uh, where they are sharing inventory with some of the free service providers out there, like Pluto and some of the others that we're familiar with. So pretty cool thing here. Now, this is not going to be on any TV boxes right away. What they're looking to do is offer this as an operating system for manufacturers. So the TV they have here is one called Vestal, which is a popular brand in Europe, and they're looking to find other partners for this new operating system. And if you're somebody that doesn't like ads on your television coming at you all the time, this might be something to be a good alternative, and it's doing a lot to index content across all of the services that you're subscribed to. So we're visiting a company called Ampere, and they've got a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, they are known for making these uh, shower speakers that are powered by the water that goes through the pipe here. And they're coming up with another version of this that is an actual shower head and speaker in one for kids. And it's one of those things where you can take it off the uh, thing, oops, off the thing and hose the kids down with it. Um, so there are ways, thank you, <laughs> as I wreck their booth here, uh, to uh, get some music in the shower powered by the water that goes through it. In my hand here are uh, some of their new sunglasses. These are called the Dusk Glasses. And these are designed, as you can see, for sporting applications. And they have a sensor on the front that will make the uh, glasses tint differently based on the amount of light that the sensor detects. And you can also control it with your phone. And then also built in are some nice speakers here too. So you get kind of a headphone functionality, uh, automatic sunglasses kind of all in one unit here. Kind of good for skiers and others who are out and don't want to wear headphones and want some flexibility as to how much tint they get. And there's a way you can control the tint level uh, based on your preferences and how fast you want it to transition from one tint level to the other. And then this thing I thought was kind of fun. This is a little alarm clock uh, or timer. And what it does is it allows you to set a timer and you put your phone in here and it locks the phone up until the timer expires. So if you can't, if you have a problem like hold, you know, getting rid of your phone or stopping using your phone, you put it in here and it locks it up so you can't use it until the timer expires. Uh, they tell me, though, there is an emergency release if something were to happen to it so your phone won't be trapped in it forever. But it's one of those things that you can train yourself better to, you know, maybe take a break from the phone every once in a while. Might be good for kids as well. This is still a prototype. It's not yet available. Uh, the sunglasses there cost $249. So we were walking by the Sennheiser table, and Sennheiser is actually not that far from me in Connecticut. So I always like to see what they've got cooking. And this is their new product, Conversation Clear Plus. And it looks like a pair of earbuds, which it is, and it can play music and all that kind of stuff. But what it also does when you're in a really noisy environment like this one is that it can enhance the conversations that you're having with people so you don't have to lean in as much. So I often have trouble hearing people in these noisy environments. And with just a twist of the dial there, you can draw out the voice of the person that is speaking to you. And it's not just amplifying it. It's using some algorithmic uh, analysis of the audio in real time to try to bring that voice out. And I tested this a few minutes ago with my friend here. I stepped back pretty far. He didn't change his tone of voice. And when I took them out, there was a noticeable difference. 
and it doesn't bring up the ambient noise all that much, but it did bring up his voice. So if you're not quite hard of hearing, but you sometimes have issues hearing things in noisy places like this, perhaps something to consider. Uh, this costs $849, which is about in line with similar products like this one. Now, I've been a big fan of the Sennheiser Momentum headphones for quite a while now. I had a wired pair, the first generation, that just sounds spectacular. What I like about the Sennheiser audio is that it's not favoring too much bass. It's very well balanced. It's really great for listening to music. And when I want to relax, I just plug these things in with some lossless audio with Plex amp, and I'm, I'm good. So this is their latest wireless version. And these are noise canceling. And this is the Momentum 4. Uh, what's new on these, they have a capacitive surface here for controlling the audio. So if you want to have the volume go up, you just kind of trace your finger on it. Uh, still sounds great. Can't really improve the sound more than they did in the first iteration, I think. But these always do have some nice improvements from one to the next. Of note is that it's got a DAC built in. So if you connect it to your computer via USB Type-C, you get the Sennheiser DAC processing the audio for you. So you get a really nice wired experience for those lossless audio files. You also can, of course, plug it in with a headphone jack and connect over Bluetooth. This does support APTX, so you can get some higher bandwidth and some uh, variability of that bandwidth on Bluetooth. So a lot of good options here and a great headphone for some folks who are looking for a more balanced sound. And these cost $349, and they are available now. Now, we've been doing a lot of content lately on satellite communication mostly via amateur radio, but I've been fascinated with how quickly everyday cell phones have been able to connect to satellites as well. We've got the Apple iPhone with their SOS. This is a new offering from a company called Bullet who's been making ruggedized Android smartphones for a while now, some of them uh, in the Caterpillar brand. And they've got a new satellite communication protocol that works with just a regular smartphone that they manufacture, along with phones that they're going to be uh, having their technology licensed to. And this is called Bullet Satellite Connect. And what it does is it connects up with the Inmarsat satellite that's in geosynchronous orbit. And what that means is that the satellite is always overhead. So where the iPhone has to kind of wait for a satellite to come in range and track it on this thing, the satellite is always in the same place, but it's much, much higher. So I'm curious as to how much power they're using to get those signals up. It doesn't let you talk to anybody, but it does send messages. So if you got stranded somewhere, they have an SOS button you can push. You can uh, regularly check in with your location if you're out in the wilderness somewhere to let people know where you are. And it's not that expensive. So the service offering for 30 messages a month it's going to be about five bucks, which is a lot less than some other satellite services might cost you. They have a few other plans, as you can see here as well. But a neat uh, idea here and something that I think might be really useful. And it's going to start showing up in more than just the bullet phones uh, rolling forward based on who they license this to. This is the SOS button that you saw. You have your messaging. You can do about 140 characters like the old Twitter uh, was. So uh, you can send out a message here and also, also uh, drop in your current GPS coordinates. So definitely keep an eye on this. So that's going to do it for this series of dispatch videos from CES 2023. We are exhausted. We have been pounding the pavement since we got here, and we haven't slept all that much because you're either uh, collecting content or editing content or uploading content, and there's just no time in between. But I know how much all of you enjoy this. I enjoy doing this because you like to watch it. And hopefully we'll be back next year for CES 2024, where we will do this all over again and hopefully get some sleep in between now and next year. I do these kinds of videos throughout the year, actually, because there are events from PEPCOM and other organizations that happen in New York City. So if you go to lon.tv slash dispatches, you can see all of the different dispatch videos I have done when I'm on the road. I would love to hear from you about what you thought about the coverage this year, what I could be doing differently next year, do let me know down in the comments section because we're always changing our strategy for uh, making this content better from CES. And it was great to be back finally in person after three years for me here. And I also want to thank producer Jake, who's been uh, going nonstop with me the whole time, and I greatly appreciate his help bringing all of this to you. So that's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. I'll probably take a day or two off, and we'll be back with more tech reviews from the Basement Studio. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters. 
including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Logic AGR, Tom Albrecht, and Am De Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.